Okay, everybody. Today, we are going to try and take the feature we've been prototyping together. And remember, we've been doing essentially prototype-driven development. This is something I see not a lot of people do, especially not in big companies. Oh, do you like my YouTube thumbnails there? <laughs> um, we're taking essentially a feature from we don't want to do this big, giant two-month waterfall. We want to prototype our way there. We want to do exploratory prototyping to take an idea through a basic working concept into a code and UI cleanup and then to ship it. So as a reminder, we are making a feature where our Figma plugin right here and go to Figma, open builders Figma plugin, which converts designs to high quality responsive code. And we want the Figma plugin to be able to log in and actually share a key. So connect to your builder account. Right now it's all anonymous and it launches you to builder separately. And then we want to be able to read and write data from a database there. So let me show you how we're gonna do this. And here is my code. Now, a couple of things, we need to finish the feature and the functionality. And we also need to go ahead and um, make sure that we clean up this code. And that's one of the things I wanna start doing here. Here's a simple example where I have a React component with an on-click handler, and there's a lot going on here. And this is just hard to read. That yes, it's imperative, and yes, you could kind of step through it and figure it out, but I wanna refactor this. There's also a couple issues I've identified with this code. The first issue I identified is right here. So right here, we're doing a polling mechanism. And somebody in the YouTube comments was angry that I'm doing polling. And they probably didn't watch the video and missed why we chose polling. This is a funny example, actually, of there are no absolutes in the world. They were talking about using message queues. And I realized they don't know what they're talking about in this context because there is no way to use a message queue from a Figma front end uh, plugin. And this is a simple example where polling is one of the ugliest things I generally recommend not doing. But this is one of the very few cases that this is a much simpler solution than anything else out there. After reading Angry Guy's YouTube comment about all of the things he proposes, it was very easy to see how all of them would have either not been possible or would have been drastically more complicated. But we can encapsulate this better, right? We're doing a lot in this click handler. We are initiating a pop-up, then we are um, doing a polling, and I found some issues. So in our polling, we are checking to see if we have a value. It's one of those weird circumstances where we're having to do a two-way communication between a Figma plugin, which is one JavaScript environment, and the builder.io web app, which is a separate JavaScript environment, it's a web application, but we can only send messages from Figma to Builder. We cannot send messages from Builder to Figma. That's because the Figma plugin does not allow window opener references. So the way you normally do this is say, um, the normal way, the easy way to do this, if we were allowed, is we'd say, and a lot of people have said this in comments in past videos, const opener equals window.open, and then the opener, we can listen to events so we can pass events to it. Now, in this case, that is not an option, unfortunately. Every time you do call window.open from a Figma plugin, opener is null. So, how do you solve when you need two way message passing, yet the technologies of choice that you, don't, you cannot change? only allow one way, one direction. Well, you essentially then write the message you want to send back to a third place, a separate API. And then the Figma plugin, because I also cannot send messages from that to the Figma plugin, um, because remember we're doing auth and uh, without, without having the auth key, we also can't set up things like WebSockets. And again, we don't want to overcomplicate this. This is a one-time message. We don't need WebSockets. We don't need more complicated things. All we need to do is have this Figma plugin ping a few times until we get a response. But it will 404 at first. So it will 404 if it can't find anything and then eventually 200. And I did something wrong here. Let's see if you can spot the bug. This is hard because we're, we're doing this quickly. But the bug is right here. Generally speaking, when you get a response, you want a 200 um, as the kind of end response, even if it followed redirects. Um, or you want to handle an error. Now, in this case, you know, res.ok will be false if we have a um, 404. Um, at least that is if GPT is correct. Uh, 
if the HPK, yeah, exactly. Res LOK will be true if we are in the range of 200 to 299 status codes. So we're gonna get a 404. Now a 404 actually means just let's move on, it's okay. So let's first handle that here. If res.status equals 404, we are going to, well, my first thought is to say continue, but we have another issue here, which is we're on a while loop and we want to ping this backend every so often. Yet in this case, we don't want to do it too often. The API here should respond very fast in just a few milliseconds, um, just the way our API infrastructure works. And so what we don't want is we don't want to be pinging this like crazy, sending a million requests. So we still want to await this delay promise. Now there's maybe a better place I can move this so that we're not doing this in multiple places. Um, but for now, let's just go with this. Remember, we're kind of prototyping our way there to finding a good solution, and then we'll clean up code. And we're starting to layer in a little bit of code cleanup because we're trying to go from our kind of full stack feature app execution over to um, being 100% ready to go to production. So let's go over here and, oops, and let me um, take this down the next step. So next step here is we want to actually get this thing done. Now, I'm torn between if I want to refactor this right now or if I want to um, just continue coding on my prototype. That's kind of the interesting balance that you have to do here when you're going in this kind of prototyping methodology is when do we start cleanup? Do we wait till the very, very end, do any cleanup at all? Or do we kind of start layering some cleanup as we go? I'm gonna start layering a little bit of cleanup as we go. Like now we do have this, which is a much better approach. And we do have this res.okay. Um, this is another little detail here too. We probably also not okay, this is a bad, bad example. Let's do this. Um, HTTP request failed with status and let's add the status code and my handy little um, and res.status, there we go. So that's at least better. And this is not a generic HTTP request, we actually know what this is. We say the, um, the polling request for Figma plugin auth, we can get a little bit better there, right? Okay, good. Now, what we really wanna do is get this to production. And so let's keep going. I'm trying to look over if there's any other quick wins for us to clean this code up. One obvious one would be to extract this to a separate function. And so maybe we will do that. I'm, uh, the problem is we have a lot of this set state references. So we'd have to rethink how to refactor this where we can move some of those kind of state calls out. Um, better. Um, one question here, yeah, rather than so many states individually, would it be better to use dispatch? We could, we could use a single state object or a reducer. I am again though, trying to make this as easy as possible. I will say, I do not like React use state in general. I really like using MobX and that's something that I actually generally would use. I try to keep this um, example, you know, applicable to everyone, not everybody uses MobX, but the way I would actually usually do this is use MobX and say const, um, local state or const state equals use local store is what they call it. And here we basically can put, have an object with all our different state. That is a really nice reactive approach that works beautifully. But in this case, I don't mind having a few state properties here. Now it looks like we're setting a lot down here. This is the only case where we're setting multiple. In many cases, we're setting these kind of one off. So I kind of like them separate because there's a lot of places we're gonna read or write to them individually. But here, yeah, you see, on the case where we're, A, we're totally successful, we're just gonna write everything. We're gonna update the state across the board. Now there's a few other changes we need to make here, um, but let's go with this. I could see a future refactor we can do where we take this while loop out and we have a function for like, you know, start polling. And then we can have maybe callbacks for, you know, on success or on error. In fact, maybe we do that because that will be a little bit cleaner. So one thing we can do, I wanna try one thing here. Oh, and we have the delay promise, but we create it within here. Yes, okay. So let's do this in VS Code. I'm gonna try and see if I can pull off a nice little refactor here where we're gonna say, um, surround with AC push statements. Darn, I want to pull this out into its own function. I swear there's a way to do that. You can extract, um, why don't, why don't we do this? Let's see if GoPilot can do this. Extract this function out um, 
into extract this logic out into its own separate function. Let's see if Copilot can do this. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that, oh, there we go. Hey, it's actually doing a decent job and it's naming it pretty well too. That's pretty interesting actually. Now, one thing to keep in mind too is you might say, well, this is not a reused function. So it's not necessarily, what the heck is this? This is not a function we're going to reuse. So why do you need to pull it out into a function in the first place? And really the, 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 the reason is because functions, creating a function, refactoring to create multiple functions is not just a product of making things reusable. This is something that took me forever to learn personally. I always thought if you're going to, um, if you're not gonna reuse a function, you don't need to extract logic into a function. And that's really not true at all. A function it does a couple things. One, importantly, makes your logic easier to read and follow. Just giving sort of like labels to pieces of logic really helps us understand and remind ourselves what's going on. Breaking things into discrete pieces rather than these long kind of imperative control flows. Um, we could add comments throughout, but honestly, that's, that's questionable how much that really, really helps here. And good functions with good names and kind of clean inputs and outputs can really save a lot. And so I kind of like how Copilot did this. We can just start by pulling this out to a function in the kind of web one level and scope. At least we kind of know what's going on here. And then we can call that function here. Wait, pull for private key request ID. Cool. This looks a lot better. Also, you know, making this click handler smaller allows us to kind of see the markup here better. Because one common complaint about React, and arguably PHP, is when you can so deeply intermix your logic and your markup, it makes your um, code a lot harder to sort of see in a glance. You want to just kind of see your component composition and really what you're seeing is tons of JavaScript. Now we could pull the whole click handle out, but in my opinion, I don't think that's strictly necessary here. We may refactor that later. We'll test in a moment if this is still working. Now, another thing we recognized last time is we created an API for being able to, this is Express API, which we magically learned that Express in TypeScript now, which I don't even feel like we're using the latest, greatest Express and types. And TypeScript only added these sort of like static typing of string literals fairly recently. But we found something crazy, which is when you have URL params as strings, this colon space ID colon ID, we get full type safe access in this object. That was a huge learning for me. But one thing we, we did originally is when we we're doing this key exchange back here, we saved just the key, but we actually need more information. We need also the space ID. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna have to actually go to also our CLI auth page, and we're gonna have to save more information. We are going to save so soon I'm gonna actually use the real private key, um, but I'm using a placeholder for now, so I'm not exposing you know keys to the public. And what we're going to do is, okay, it actually looks like we already save, let's see, private key, APK user ID, cool. So I guess we're already saving that. So maybe it's our API. Um, let's see, I can't remember now where we're only saving, or maybe it's, uh, I, it might be in here actually, S pull for private key. Um, got private key. Okay, so that's actually just save more information here. So we have data.private key is one of the things we get. We also get the API key and user ID. Okay, let's save all those things. User ID, data user ID, and we're going to save the API key, um, data dot, do, 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 data dot, API keys that we called it. Yes, data.api key. And you can see we had that really cool TypeScript message passing mechanism here where we um, everything is type safe. So it's a warning this is not here. So I can jump into the definition here using a huge discriminated union. Um, we're going to go to, where is it? Got private key. I swear I could jump to it through this. There we go. And we're gonna save also the API key string um, and we're going to, I'm actually gonna call it a space ID. In Builder, the space ID and public keys are actually interchangeable um, in, in at least the cases that apply to us now. And let's save, uh, we, let's save the user ID. We're taking this, I don't think we're going to use it, um, but let's save it for now. 
And so now we have all these pieces of information. Um, why is it complaining? Oh, that's right, space ID. Space ID is what we're doing, cool. Um, okay, so now, here we go. Oh, and also, just to point out a couple of things, getting a couple questions here, you know, come kind of from the more beginner audience, like, hey, can you kind of share some beginner friendly um, um, tips here or kind of how would you get into new tech stacks? The one thing I really want to show with these streams is an example of how I navigate a real production code base. So using a real production code base where you may not know what, where everything is, um, you may not know what the code does, it may not be tested all the way, may not be documented all the way, all that stuff. Um, those, I think there's a lot of nuanced skills here that are best demonstrated just by honestly just kind of looking over somebody's shoulder as they're coding on real code base. Not everything here is meant to be just totally understandable, but I hope it's interesting to just watch what the process looks like for somebody kind of working through and kind of solving problems incrementally. The more complex the code base you're entering, the more I think you really do need to use some form of an iterative methodology where you're just testing ideas. You're not overly planning how you're going to solve a feature you're really thinking through and trying to try approaches and see what the constraints of the code and the tech and all those things are allowing it to do. Striking that balance of how do I implement what I need and how do I make it functional and efficient and all of that without overthinking, over-engineering, over-planning, painting yourself in corners, all those things that I think many people are inclined to do because we tend to get overconfident. Um, another question, why not Vue and Nuxt? Vue and Nuxt are phenomenal and amazing. And unfortunately, we use React. I am very back and forth on React in general, um, but that is the tech stack we're using here. I prefer Quick if I'm given my choice of anything, and that's what we build everything net new with, but we're extending some code that's already kind of existed here. Um, and the diagramming tool I use is Excaladraw, excaladraw.com. Okay, so there's another thing we need to do here too. Now when we go to the handler of this got private key, Instead, we're going to want to save all this information. So right now we're saving it under a key called builder private key. Let's change this. Let's call this um, builder space info and we'll rename this variable. Let me actually check if there's any other places we use this. Um, we do, 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 builder private key. Do we use this anywhere else? Nope, okay. It is only using this one file, perfect. Um, so we're gonna rename this um, builder space, maybe I'll call it builder private space info, just so you remember that it's something that should be careful. And let's do, uh, let's rename builder private space info, builder private space info store ID. Cool. Okay. People popping in, what's happening? We're trying to finish a feature where we can authenticate from our Figma plugin, from, whoop, there it is. From our Figma plugin, we can pass keys through this little loop here, and then we can start making read and write quests authenticated to a database from a Figma plugin that previously had no authentication. We are not worrying about having a pretty UI here. Oh, I can see our login buttons back, so we can test this end to end in a moment. And we are focused on the functionality, and then we will see if we can get these things live and in production. So we're making good progress. And the other thing that, let's see, we changed. We changed this interface. One thing I actually wanna do now too is I want to type out what this interface is. So let's start here. So we're now no longer just storing in Figma storage one thing, a string. We are storing a whole object. And so I'm gonna create a type for this, builder private space info equals. Let's see if Copilot knows. Yep, private key. There's a couple more. Do you know Copilot what it is? It's not a... Let's see, I think it was user ID, string, and then it was a space ID. Perfect, let's export this, we might reuse this. And now let's wrap our, um, let's see, get async. Yeah, so let's wrap the logic here because we want to make sure we are type safe here. So instead of all this fib client storage get async, which returns a promise any, we don't want that anymore. We are going to say, create a function up here, export function, export async function, um, get builder, um, what do we want to call this? Uh, get builder private space info. 
um, from client storage. I'm tempted to use the long name, um, but let's go with this for now. We'll decide later if the long name was a good idea or excessive. Um, okay, it's complaining because we need to do this. Return, await, get async. Beautiful. And actually, technically, we don't need the await there, but that's okay. And now let's also set export. Um, is it set async? Figma.clientStorage.set async? Yeah, okay. Export async function set. Will it figure out everything I want? There we go. Looks good to me. Set blah, 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 blah. Cool. Now we want to go through and find out, because we're factoring this code, we want to find all references to this and actually keep it encapsulated. This way we have all of our type safety here. Um, and actually, I don't think this return type is necessary. Let's just pass it through. This return type is required. This input type is required. The return type, I'd like to just not annotate it manually so that if the um, if the Figma API changes at all, you know that just passes through automatically. We don't have to fight these overrides. There's some good videos online about why um, using as little as possible return type annotations I think is great. Um, uh, oh yeah, really says they love QuickJS. I love QuickJS. The reactivity, the performance, all that stuff. It looks like he's been using it to build landing pages and hopefully can build full sites and apps. Yes, um, in my opinion, that's sort of the good path to go down. Um, so here's our delete async. So this is actually okay. I'm okay with leaving that. Here we want to do, let's do this. Um, const builder space info equals await. There we go, for client storage. And now we can send back, um, let's send back the builder space info. Maybe we can just send it as one big object and builder space info. Okay, so let's actually go to this definition and let's say builder space info and go builder private space info. Great. Or null or undefined. Oof, this one's hard. Let's, let's be explicit here. Let's pass it as null. Just as a FYI, this is a common question in TypeScript. Do you do this for something optional? I think making an optional property is really good for if you don't need the user to always conscientiously when, when, when kind of creating this object to conscientiously know if you need to provide this or not. Switching to this, a required property that can either be a certain type or null, means that you will always, the ID will always say, hey, you need to be explicit. Are you passing it or not? That way you just never forget to pass it. And so I think this is a good time to use the type or null. And cool. Why am I getting type errors on this? Let's find out, but required key does not exist. Oh, yep, 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 yep. Um, maybe we will do, um, yeah, let's do this. Instead of just storing the private key, we're gonna say let builder space info, uh, builder private space info or null equals null. Great. Message dot builder space info dot private key and builder space info equals message builder space info. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we're refactoring. We're making sure we pass through the data we need. Let's also do this. Um, space info set space info. So we're basically refactoring this code because at first we thought we only needed one key to pass around. Turns out we need several things. We need a whole object. Part of me is like, hey, we should have known this in the first place. We should have just passed a whole object everywhere because why not? But you know, here, this is kind of what we learn as we go. Builder space info. Great. And then there's a set something call here. Yep. Set space info. And we were just going to set all of this so set space info to and we know the types here come on get copilot you could do it oh oh almost had it i hit escape prematurely beautiful set space info cool now in theory this should work end to end and in theory what we want to do is test i've got this do stuff button and i'm thinking maybe what i'll do is just for fun i will I'm trying to think of how I want to test this out. So there's a couple things we need to do here. Actually, let's start by just finishing out our do stuff logic. So our KV endpoint, if you remember, KV stands for key value. 
we just want to send a space ID and then a document ID. In fact, I kind of want to rename this. Can I rename this? Oh, wow. It's actually aware that this is a symbol. Wow, that's cool. Um, document ID. Using the term just plain ID is a little silly. Okay, let's do this. Rename signal. Oops. Params.id. And these two, I want to do document ID. Great. Yeah, that I think is much better. Oh, right here too, document ID. I really should do that here as well. These couple areas where I'm just using ID, it's really, really kind of a bad practice to just use ID. Let's be a little more clear on what the heck we're dealing with here. We have a document ID. Uh, maybe I'll just update all of this stuff. Document ID. Yeah, that's better. I think that's going to read better, be easier to follow, especially if we ever have to deal with multiple IDs. So a key value store with space ID, document ID. This is to allow maximum flexibility. This is actually a case where we have some developers on our team who have not worked with our APIs, and so I really don't want them to have to update APIs. If they need to read and write data from the plugin, they should be able to just read and write any data. We don't have to update, deploy, wait on a release, any of that stuff, a back end for front ends, new front end requirements, new front end data we need to store and query all that good stuff okay so we're doing good and yes we are using express.js here um this is another example of it bet you if you ask twitter should you use express.js they'll be like no you should use this or that or this or that honestly it doesn't matter that much express.js is great very simple app.get app.put app delete. i've never used express and said oh i really need to use something else now there probably are nicer things and if you really are trying to get particular about what is the perfect thing you could do a big old analysis. But, you know, I, I really, I, I've shared this before. I really get sick of the hyper perfectionism, hyper debates of, of the Twitter verse. And yeah, Koa is great too. Um, most likely though, when you're talking about performance, the express server itself is not truly ever gonna be your performance bottleneck in a real world application. In a real world application, the performance bottleneck will be your business logic, your database calls, your whatever logic you're doing in here. The server itself, you know, it's kind of like, um, this thing drives me crazy too with front end frameworks. People are like, oh, this framework's a little bit faster than that one. Well, you're analyzing, generally speaking, in my opinion, you're using a benchmark. So you're not looking at a real world application. So yes, you know, the minutia of like even React is a few kilobytes larger than Vue really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the performance of the user's code is what matters by far more. And so in most cases, most of the tools that people poo poo on Twitter are fantastic and just fine. Now, I will admit, if I had the choice of using React, Vue, et cetera, et cetera, versus something older like Backbone or Ember, oh, I'm not a huge fan of Ember and Backbone, but there are some cases where, yeah, it, it, there are some constraints with some legacy frameworks that really are not as enjoyable, elegant, or easy to use or move forward uh, versus something else. Express, in my opinion, you know, worrying about the performance ex of Express is a lot like worrying about, you know, the performance of how fast the doors open on your car. <laughs> it's not actually the thing that it influences how fast the car goes is the weight of the car, the engine, all that stuff. And this is an imperfect metaphor, but a good example of this and something people don't understand about the quick framework is quick as a front end framework does not optimize for the framework itself as in you know, all the frameworks themselves are often trying to out optimize the, the other frameworks on these little kind of row insertion, stuff like that. The reality is it's user's code. You can create a hello world app in any front end framework and any back end framework, and it's going to be fast and it's going to be easy. The problem comes in when your app gets large and the way front end frameworks work is they download all of the code you wrote and they run it all on the boot up of a page and a lot of these pages are simple, right? You know, let's take a simple example of uh, a trivial example, but a marketing page. This really should not download the entirety of all the React components that were involved in building this just to have most of this stuff not even become uh, interactive in any way. Maybe this is one CSS animation, like who cares, right? That's where people are getting terrible performance without um, having much control over it. The framework just works that way. Um, there's really two solutions here. One is you move to an islands-esque architecture. So that is like Astro, that is like React server components. 
Um, that is where you have to make very forward thinking decisions about where you put code that will not hydrate in the browser and where you put code that will hydrate. So you're writing code two different ways. And anytime you realize, oh, this didn't need actor interactivity, now it does, or vice versa, you're having to do a lot of rewriting of code and refactoring. Then there's a separate class of frameworks. Um, I would put Quick and Marco in this class, which is it's way, it's, it's the DX you expect, which is just like React or Vue or whatever, you just write components and you move on with your life. But a set of compilers automatically optimize your code and not just the framework, but your code. They make sure that if you don't have inter any interactivity on this section or this section or this section, none of that delivers to the browser automatically. React server components, Next.js app router, um, Astro, you always have to cognitively know. And rewriting code when needs change, and that's something we all need to remember is in good software development, needs constantly change. Because the reality is, every time we're developing software, we're trying to figure out what our users need and how we deliver that. And the answer is never clear. If you think it's clear, you're already wrong. <laughs> you need to, in my opinion, acknowledge from the get-go that the answer is 100% not clear. We need to run experiments on our user base, on the ecosystem, to find out what works. And in order to do that effectively, we need to be able to iterate. And if iteration requires constant cognitive overhead of what is the performant way, write things this way for performance and this way for interactivity, it really becomes a mess and the refactoring is a huge pain. And it really is, in my opinion, a total nightmare. Intellectually interesting, yes, a nightmare in practice. That's where Quick and Marco make it all automatic. And they use techniques inspired by Google. If you go to google.com, this is all powered by a framework called Wiz. Hello world. Google Tom is crazy fast, especially for how complex it is and for how many different types of interactivity it has. Or let's do like show times will give us all these type of interactive widgets. And they all seem to load instantly. They all are interactive and have all kinds of different stuff in it. This is created by a framework called Wiz. It uses a really interesting technique to make sure that when you load pages, no matter how advanced, you only load the HTML and JavaScript executes lazily and as needed, which is the polar opposite of how modern frameworks work, like React, Vue, et cetera. And that means you get wildly better performance, but Wiz does not have the best developer experience. It's very lazy, uh, it's very legacy. Whereas Marco and Quick have a much nicer developer experience. It feels like writing with frameworks like React. Anyway, I'm totally digressing. Let's finish this feature and let's test out that our feature's working. So let's go out here, let's go to our login button. We're gonna go end to end feature testing here. Let's see where it fails. I like to not overthink it and let's just try it out. We're gonna authorize, we're loading. We added our janky little message. We'll clean up the message in a little bit here. Um, oh, it's waiting. Something may not be happening. Something may not be working. Uh-oh. It generally should not need to wait this long. What's wrong? Failed to fetch. Oh, sorry. I have a cool little utility I forgot in the Builder app, but it resets automatically to switch between production APIs and development APIs. So now we're gonna refresh. This is really cool, by the way. A lot of people build their applications where their uh, environments are intertwined. We 100% separate the front end and back end environments, the APIs and the front end, so that at any time you can take the front end and change API environments. You literally just open up this cool little tool, you change it, we have all kinds of other little feature flags, experiments, all the kind of mysterious experimental features that you know we're running. We allow our internal admins to switch between but it's really nice. Now I can just switch. I don't have to do a rebuild. I don't have to produce any type of dynamic environments. I just say, hey, switch to the dev APIs. And now we're doing it. So we're going to authorize and success. Cool, it's nice and fast. We're gonna head back to Figma to continue. Um, I could also put a close this window button. Maybe I'll do that actually. Let's do that really quickly while it's top of mind. Head back to Figma to continue. Let's just wrap this in a div. And let's add a button, button. Um, maybe I'll do close this window. Let's just do that for now. Color equals primary, music material UI, variant equals outlined. Um, let's maybe put this in a um, CSS equals doo -doo 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 -doo, display flex, flex direction column. I'm using a motion for this. I like to do everything with flex. Let's do, um, a line item center just for content center, cool. And there we go. Uh, nice products dashboard. Okay, and let's move this to be typography. 
and display one, if I remember right, is massive in material UI. I think I want something more like display, let's do like an H2, that still might be too big. And let's add a gap. So that'll add space in between all these children. And cool, I think this will look a little bit better. Authorize, oops, hot reload kicking in. Authorize, head back to, yeah, that's way too big. Um, let's maybe do success in the H2. Let's maybe move this to an H3. And let's do this as a, you can now head back to Figma to continue. Ah, I love Tailwind. I actually generally opt for Tailwind for new projects. Now there's some interesting new things like Panda CSS is pretty interesting. CSS hooks is somewhat interesting in my opinion. The Facebook thing is, uh, I can't remember the name now, is somewhat interesting. I really like Tailwind. It's not perfect, but I like the approach. It's very similar to this emotion style approach where you it's like pseudo inline styles, but with this one level higher abstraction around colors and spacing and stuff like that. And I like how simple the syntax is. There's small complexities around overriding styles, but there are uh, um, tools like CLSX, I think it's called, that makes that easier. But yeah, I, I am a pretty big fan of Tailwind. Let's do body one for this. Or is there a variant like P? Is that a thing? No, body one. Okay, let's see if this looks better. We're just using a design system. We're designing as we go. We'll have a designer actually help us clean this up in the end, but I'd love to be able to sometimes, well, there we go, that's not bad. Sometimes I actually like to ship things um, before we even have our designer look at it, as weird as that sounds. Like private beta type stuff, like, hey, people just trying. Okay, cool. So close this window does nothing. In order to close a window in JavaScript, all we have to do is call close. Now to make clear close is not some type of uh, locally defined function, I'll usually add window. It's not needed, but it makes it more clear. Oh, this is global variable, not like some close function that's defined locally. Let's try it one more time and see what happens. Cool, authorize, success. You can now head back to video content. I might wanna make this bigger actually. Maybe body two is bigger, I forget. This is do, 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 do. Let's make this body two and close this window. There we go. That was not too bad. Um, let's see if body two is any bigger and bolder. The spacing looked okay to me. All right, and we have our buttons here too. So that's good. So we've got do stuff and we've got log out and they're impossible to see. So let's, let's fix some stuff here. Um, in our Figma, oops, in our Figma plugin, it's a different window. Um, should I listen to Figma while uh, to listen to music while coding? Yes, I always listen to music while coding, except when I'm streaming. Otherwise, I am listening to music nonstop. I listen to Spotify's Discover Weekly a lot. Very, very random in its assortment. You can see other random stuff I listen to. Uh, very, very, very varied in terms of uh, genres and styles. Well, some patterns, but uh, quite a lot of variety because if you're coding all day or coding a lot and you have to mus listen to music a lot, you need to branch out to a lot of different genres to have interesting stuff to listen to regularly. Um, okay, so our do stuff button is really ugly. So log out, we will, um, I'm just gonna say, you know, maybe we'll leave it looking ugly for now. Let's make this full width and let's say color equals primary. And here, let's see, we should have our um, space, and space ID, great. And then, we want to have, and we'll create an ID. So let's create this like dummy document ID equals ABC123. Let me check actually for a moment that our data is being saved as expected. If so, I will actually, let's check all the way through the HTTP request and then we will actually switch to using real keys. Um, Haha, <laughs> anybody's procrastinating? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure people watching the stream maybe are. Um, React Query versus SWR, uh, in my opinion, React Query. It just seems to be much more utilized, much more up to date. And Tana Lindsley's stuff is, is really incredible. I see a lot of activity on the um, sort of developers who work on it. Um, that said, you probably can't go wrong. The basic utility of each is, is pretty simple. Okay. Um, going back. Do, where were we? What were we even doing here? We were in the 
Figma plugin, we were in our do stuff button. There we go. So we're going to make a fake dummy document ID and we're going to try to read and write to it. In fact, maybe what I'll do is I will, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to say method, okay, bearer, beautiful. That's what I wanted. Excellent. Uh, that's how the authentication works with private keys, with builders, APIs. And I want to do content, uh, content type application JSON. And then we're going to do a put. So method put. Great. That's great to hear. Yeah, I never know if these streams are boring. I'm literally just streaming as I'm working <laughs> my normal day to day job. I love people's feedback. People suggest different approaches, different ideas, or just ask random questions, which I find entertaining. And I like what people enjoy watching this. I hope it can give you another perspective on what some other developer um, with different experience than you, how they approach problems and if it's helpful at all. And especially here's the most important thing to me. Uh, I know I've ranted about this a lot lately. Um, the way you would think people, other people write code by the blog posts you see, by the tweets they put out, by the YouTube videos is so different than real, real coding. In fact, I put out YouTube videos and TikToks and tweets about here's a random tip, here's a random tip, here's a random tip. This is a nicer approach than this, blah, blah, blah. But I realized it gave people the impression that all the nice tips, all the nice tools are what I use day to day. And the reality is, no, that's not even true at all. I mean, when it's easy, definitely. But in the reality of day to day work, you just have to get the work done. You need to get it done in a reasonable and efficient manner. And you should not ever think it or over engineer it. And you're not always going to use the best tools. And you shouldn't try to refactor all the code to use a different tool because really the tools that are not the best are still plenty good, like way above the threshold of plenty good to do your job. And in many in many cases, the not best tool is the best for you or is a fantastic tool for you. Um, oh, that's a good question. So I'm a huge believer personally. Oh, why am I not using tan stack query? Um, because it's a slightly older code base. And in this case, um, I don't think it's necessary. I'm not sure. I don't think react query or tan stack query is going to add a lot here. And I like to keep things as simple as possible. And in this case, I think it's a little bit simpler. Keep in mind, I'm not doing, if I was ever doing HTTP requests on a use effect um, hook, that's one of the most biggest triggers for, oh, you should probably use React Query, Tanset Query. Um, but if we're literally just on click, firing and forgetting an HTTP request and moving on, especially in this case, these are not cached requests. And Tanset Query really helps with caching and reloads. Like that's the place where I think React Query is necessary, especially when you need a use effect. So you need like data on mounts and you might need to keep it fresh or keep it cached. In this case, that's just not the use case. So I think it's not necessary. Oh yeah, Fortate says it very well. Customers do not care what tools or how you bring it into production. Just make sure it works. Um, and this is an interesting, so a question came up from Brian. Do you think it's good to get into web design like UI design and front end? Is it worth it? Um, in my opinion, if you have the opportunity to learn both some design and front end development, and you want to be able to build really kind of cool products really quickly and do this sort of like prototype driven development, it's a fantastic toolkit to have. And so it depends on your interests. If you're not interested in design, I wouldn't force yourself to learn it. But if you have a curiosity in design, if you have an inclination towards creative work, you like music, you like if you ever were into creating artwork of any kind, I deeply enjoy design and development together and doing it all end to end. Personally, I deeply enjoy the full stack. And I don't mean front end, back end. I mean like have an idea, make a design for it, build it out, you know, iterate until you figure out the right way to build it out, share it online, market it, like literally share it on social media, create some blog posts about it, you know, all that stuff to get, to bring some users to you and then even sell it. Like you talk to a large enterprise and you, you explain to them why this is maybe a good solution for their company. The full stack, and I mean like the complete stack of you have an idea and you wanna bring it to the world and not just build it and nobody comes. I mean, build it and make sure people come and, and make sure they use it. And once they come, they have all these ideas and they have all this feedback and that's where you actually get started. That to me is the most enjoyable thing. And I think one of the biggest ways you can unlock that is to know front end development or rather full stack development. And I mean, just enough. In my opinion, my experience is mostly front end, enough back ends to be dangerous and enough design to make sure I can make a product that's at least usable. And then make sure you can get it to the world because you don't just build things that people come, you have to actually allow people to find you at a time that they're looking. So creating content online that might match a Google search is a really good way. 
Um, sharing things on social media can be a really good way. If people are already watching videos or looking at tweets and, and you could share something that introduces them to your product and you know they're interested in seeing it, that can work great as well. Um, does QuickJS support React server components? So um, with Quick, you don't not need, oh, so sorry, Quick does not support React server components. Uh, I'll make that clear. So if you want to Quickify a, a React component, you need to do client components or just agnostic components. They could be added, but with Quick, you don't really have this notion of client and server component. You just have components and they actually work more optimally on both the server and on the client. Um, that I think is important. Um, and that's what drives me crazy about React Server Components. Now I know why they do what they do. It's a very smart team with very smart people doing very smart things. What they have is you know, what we always have in engineering, which is legacy baggage. They did not have the, uh, the blessing of a Greenfields project where they can just create something from scratch brand new. So they had to figure out how do we fix some of the big problems of React without breaking the whole React ecosystem. And that's where they came up with React Server Components. With a new framework like Quick or even a much older one like Marco, there's no need for these differences. It just runs fast, faster. I mean, honestly, faster on the client and faster on the server than a framework like React um, with an analogous DX. In my opinion, a better DX because you get real reactivity, you get signals, you get deeply nested reactive stores. You get a lot of things that other frameworks like SolidJS and Vue have for free, which is really, really nice. Um, but anyway, let's keep testing our do stuff button. So I think we're making this call right. Oh, I also, we have one little nuance with the builder APIs where we also have to pass the public key up here. It is a silly redundant thing, but it works well and just trust me on it. It's a little strange we're passing this twice, but just, uh, we're just gonna deal with it. <laughs> um, a lot easier to keep going with this pattern. It allows us to make very, very reusable middlewares on our back end. Um, more for internal API calls. We'll make it more elegant for external API calls because we want developers using our platform to have the best possible experience. But internally, we can make a couple little shortcuts. And then uh, data, res.json. And so we want, really what we want is we want to be able to put a body, json.stringify. Um, let's actually do this. Const, uh, yeah, let's just do this. Body, um, hello everyone and then we want to make sure let's console log that data now we should not this should not work because right now we're using a fake private key so we'll fix that in a moment but i just want to test that this api request is working as expected oh actually sorry we want to put the data and console log uh, result of put and then we want to fetch the data afterwards because again the idea here is a key value store i can an authenticated way, send the data, and I can do some separate security testing to make sure that we can not send data without the proper credentials. I'll double check that in a moment. Even though we just reused middleware, you know, we didn't invent the auth here. We literally used the same middleware that we already used throughout application, like requires auth. But we should double check it because you never know if you use things right. If you missed a step or there was two middleware that had to be chained, you know, the require auth and the check auth, you know. So this is the result of the put, and then we're going to make a get request. Um, so HTMX is interesting. In my opinion, HTMX is good for a backend developer who doesn't know front end, doesn't want to know, and wants to keep everything backend driven. I have the per personal opposite preference. I prefer everything to be front end driven. I like to think front end first in every case. Um, it's also much cheaper having every single click of your application go back to a server and have to be executing on the server every time on a per individual basis. It's not the best for performance and it's also not the best for your backend costs running. The more you run client side and just execute in the in a user's browser as opposed to on an edge server or a, a backend server instance, as your user scale gets very, very large, that can get vastly more expensive than if you don't do that. Um, do we use our own design system? We use Material UI. Radix is fantastic too. Chakra UI is fantastic too. There's a lot. I don't like to hand roll a, a design system. I definitely like to utilize something off the shelf and, and customize it. There's a lot of nuance and accessibility that goes into these things and documentation that I would rather not create myself. Um, Mantine is best. I don't know what Mantine is. Is that a design system? I'm curious, I could check it out. Anyway, so now here we're gonna do a Git request. Um, how did it know? Apparently it knew. So we're gonna do an authenticated Git request and um, Git response. Maybe I'll rename this to put response, put response, and this will be 
put data, and we're gonna do the get response, and let's do const data equals get response out data, and result of get, get data, beautiful. Now this should fail, but we're going to test it out. So going over here, we should hot reload. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, you can use Builder.io with WordPress websites. You can integrate our HTML API and use Builder to drag a drop and then produce through there. Now, it does require a developer to integrate, though. It's not a, a just out-of-the-box thing. Majority of people use Builder with, with modern frameworks like React, but you absolutely can use it with WordPress. One use case people do use Builder with WordPress is to... Um, make migration easier. Interestingly, if you're migrating a website and you build it all in WordPress and you have to rewrite all of that, the whole website line by line in React or whatever, quick, etc. If you build things in Builder, which is completely framework agnostic, that it's a visual system, then you can actually plug it into WordPress, build out a bunch of stuff in Builder. If you migrate to Next.js, Quick.js, Vue.js afterward, you have to rewrite everything except what you did in Builder. Everything in Builder that output it to WordPress now will output exactly as expected to the other framework. It's pretty cool. We use abstractions above frameworks to create completely framework agnostic components using our Mitosis compiler. Ah, uh, yes, this is another one you could do. You don't always have to have a separate variable for your response and your JSON. You could just say const data equals fetch, you know, and dot then res res.json, totally. The only downside of this is generally you want to check this if not put response out okay and do something and that's the only one annoying part about that is you want to have access to both the status code the um you know the dot okay property is an easy easy shorthand um and the data itself and separating them i used to always do that trick where uh this one right here but now these days i pretty much always separate the two just so i can check this so we can let's uh just say hey the put failed and here we can also if not get response because it get failed so we'll just kind of keep track of this for now um and yeah we want to stay out of callback hell too though i don't think that um this is callback hell at all because um const foo equals fetch dot then it's kind of cool how with promises you can both combine async await and chaining a lot of people don't do this they kind of feel like you have to do async await or dot then but you actually could do both and that part is pretty nice but that's again where you probably want this res if not res dot okay throw an error something like that and then it's like ah eh, we might as well just flatten it to async await um yeah and so um here we go. So we're making progress and yeah, we wanted to test this out. So let me stop saving. So I stop hot reloading. Oh, we have to log in again. Why do we have to log in again? Did I not save our data? Did I rename something? I'm not sure why I have to log in again. I'll see if that keeps happening to us. So here we go. Authorize. Our page looks better. Close the window. Now we're going to have to actually go all the way back. We've got our do stuff button. Okay. And do stuff should fail because we actually are not using correct headers, but I wanna see if the HTTP request looks correct. So put failed, we expected that. Oops, I did not have dead tools open, it wasn't recording. Let's do this again, do stuff, put failed. Perfect. Um, and the reason, oh yeah, our middleware is handling all of the you know contact support for help. Um, let's see, and we should, it should say, um, the request headers should say uh, authorization bearer foobar. Okay, perfect. So let's always go. Let's actually set this up for real. So here, I'm going to actually start using a real private key. Get private key. Cool. Great. Now, let's go back to our Figma plugin. Let's log out. Beautiful. Let's reload this. I want to make sure that logout persisted. That was not just an in-memory change. So we're doing a little bit of testing as we go. Okay, great. And now, what do we want? We want this. We want login. I'm going to check the persistence of the login in a moment here as well. Authorize, success, close the window. There we go. We've got do stuff. And we don't have any loading state. That's fine. Did do stuff work? Did it work? Nope, we're still not happy. So let's see what we're doing wrong here. Um, I am going to, oh, this is actually kind of good. So I'm gonna double check 
the state of this request uh, network. Um, let's see here. Let's try this again. Why are we not happy? Do stuff is accessing local host. It's using, that looks like the correct space ID. Let's double check. Is that the correct space ID? Builder dot public key. Does that look like that? Oh, actually we are using a different space, another new space. Let's try this again. Does that, hey Ayub. Uh, public key, cool, that looks good. So that is the space ID. Is there any planned quick content? I will always put out a new quick content. Nothing off the top of my head, but that's because we're working on this visual copilot feature right now, or I am at least. But I will always, I rant a lot on the stream about quick too. So I should really put out some more stuff. I, I will be doing that. Um, let's see. And now let's double check all of our stuff. So KV, document ID. So let's see if, um, let's look at our API logs. Oh, do we have an error here? Perhaps, oh no, that was just the general request. So everything looks fine. Let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's try this again. Oops, that's not the one I want. I want Figma, I want do stuff. 401 unauthorized. Do I have a favorite theme for VS Code? Yeah, I use the default dark. How lame is that? But that is actually what I use. Um, cool. Oh, something is wrong here. I definitely know something is wrong here. API key, yes, 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 yes. One second. API key, API key equals, ah, yeah, we don't want the private key. We want the space ID, AKA the public key. And here we're gonna do the same thing, space ID. Okay, let's try this again. And let's go. All right, everybody pray. Everybody pray that this works. Why do I have to log in again? Hold on. There's something wrong about the login check. Is logged in, is logged in. I thought I sensed something. My spidey senses went off. Um, is logged in. Message up those space about that private key. Okay, that should be there. User is logged in, user is logged in. Um, oh, maybe I'm opening this too fast. Hold on, I have a, a funny idea. Oh, maybe I should need to duplicate. Okay, give it one second. Nope. Why are we not logged in? I'm pretty sure. Let's see, let's double check this. Let's double check that our Figma stuff is there. So Figma dot client storage dot get async. Okay, we're gonna check this in the JavaScript console here. Um, let's see. Let's go. Um, what was it? Figma dot. Um, hold on. Figma dot client storage dot get async. In my opinion, when getting into programming, learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That is that is how I started, at least. And that worked really well, because you could build literally anything with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What? You could build native apps. You could build websites. You could build front ends. You could build back ends. Ah, so this is not correct. This should be the full set builder. OK, set builder private. Oh. Oh, we're not using this. Oh, that explains a lot. Set builder private space. Okay, set async. Let's find all references of this. We missed in our refactory, missed a reference. That's very understandable. Set async. Okay, that one we want. This is the one we don't want. There we go. We instead want, oh wait, this is why we want type safety. Boom. And there we go. Okay, let's log in again. And let's see. Let's see, okay, log in. Oh, that's a good point. I says on the sort of modern JavaScript, HTML, CSS stack, the job market is very competitive. A lot of people have that skill set. A lot of people take it boot camps. It could be hard. It sounds like C Sharp Java there is more jobs with less people looking for the jobs. That's interesting, that very might be the case. I will say, 
companies are evolving more and more to use JavaScript for more and more things is what I tend to find. Um, but sometimes more legacy stuff is where people need um, more help. Oh, I think we, everybody, I think we succeeded. In theory, our tools work end to end. Um, have I ever been tired of coding? Yes, absolutely. I do get tired of coding. I do get burnt out on coding. Um, I will tell you the thing that works best for me is, I know I keep coming back to this, but this idea of prototype driven development, the idea of always being handed a ticket, fix the ticket. I can get behind that, but sometimes it will get old. I like to, my personalities, I like to explore and create new things. And so whenever I feel burnt out, whenever I feel tired of coding, I like to try and experiment with something new. I get really excited by new experiments. I personally get really excited by things that have yet to be proven possible. For instance, this design to code stuff has been something people wanted forever, but nobody could deliver effectively. And we have new tools at our disposal. We have new uh, advancements in AI that can close some of these key gaps. And that's really, really exciting to me. Um, oh my goodness, Adam Tate. I thought you were Andrew Tate for a second. I was like, Andrew Tate is on this, <laughs> or somebody impersonating. But thank you, I appreciate the kind words tremendously. Um, Oh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, if you're bored of coding, watching other people code, I enjoy watching other people code, weirdly enough. So I, I appreciate that some of you enjoy watching me code too. Um, oh yeah, and a good point here. I mentioned JavaScript's great because you could code everything. There are definitely cases where you should use other languages instead too, right? There are better backend programming languages. Go, it's probably actually, if you're purely writing a backend and you don't have to worry about the type of people who are gonna work on the code in, in terms of like, if you need front-end developers to work on it, et cetera, Go is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> Are you really Adam Tate to ask if you're related to Andrew Tate? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you could say you're not related. Um, let's see. Remember Grid? I don't know Grid. I got 10 million for an AI website built 10 years ago, but there was no chance. Yeah, exactly. Um, people have always wanted the idea of AI website building. They always want the idea of AI write my code for me, and we're finally kind of I think making real headway there. And there's real opportunities around here as well. Um, Finding projects. How do you find projects? That's a really good question as well. Let me make sure I'm not late for a meeting. Good, I'm not. Um, so how do I find projects? Um, you know, I have a specific area of interest and, you know, I, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a, a startup that works in the sort of like world between uh, design and development. And right now, today, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in design development. There's another thing I want to do, which I've been prototyping, which is making it so that you can produce Figma designs from code, uh, sorry, from prompts. So you can say like, hey, I want to blah, 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 and it could design it all kind of on brand using your Figma components, all that stuff. That's something that's really exciting to me. That said, you know, I think that's probably an important place to start is what, what do you care about? And actually the best thing in the world, I'll tell you, if you need a project idea, solve your own problem. Literally pay attention to your day to day. What do you do? How do you use it on your Mac, on your PC, on your website you use? and ask yourself, is there something annoying that I can just fix? Is there a little Mac app I can build, a Chrome extension I could build, a little mini website tool that can do something for me? That's where I get the most, that's where I feel the most good when I'm developing, is whenever I'm building something that solves my problem. And that's the best way, in my opinion, to build something that other people will find useful. Because it's one thing, it's one thing to build something just to build something. I get tired of that really quickly. It's a, it's a step up to build something that solves your problems. And it's another step up to, to see other people use what you've built and feel that joy of, oh, I love this. This made my life better. This improved my productivity. This improved. This just was delightful to use. I love coming back to using it. One silly example. I'll give you the, the silliest example ever. A friend of mine shared with me one time that there were these newsletters. I forget. It was called like Tom's Guide or something. Tom's Flights. I don't remember. There was this newsletter that would send you every once in a while, um, like once a week or something, extremely low price flights. They were like errors that happened, but they were still um, still selling tickets even though there's a data entry error of, of putting the wrong price on a flight. Um, or a few other edge cases that would cause insanely low flights. You could fly from like San Francisco to Paris for like $100. And so I, I saw this kind of was spreading around people I knew and people would check the newsletter every day to see if the, to see if um, there was any flight that was going from to somewhere they wanted to go from where they are. And that's the always the big question when it comes to should I code something or should I build a project? It's like, well, is there something people are doing manually that I can automate? Basic example, turning Figma designs to code. People are doing it manually all the time. How do we automate that? Or this case, a much simpler case, people are checking their inbox every week 
just to visually check to see if it's going from San Francisco to somewhere they want to go. So I made a little tool one time that was just a very simple application. It was a website. I put it on flights.builder.io. Um, someone reminded me of this just yesterday. And it was just a where do you want to go from where to where. And you can list as many places you want. So it'd be like San Francisco or New York or whatever to, you know, Paris, London, uh, Bangkok, whatever, Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera, so Tokyo, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, then you would get an email from this service only when flights matching your criteria were found. And you could even set up like special alerts. Um, in that case, you could save a lot of time, not have to check this email all the time. I set up a very simple process to just uh, scrape um, these Newsletters also had blogs. I would just scrape the blog every so often, like cron job once a day. Let's scrape. Let's look at what they found. And I would just send it to you. And that was it. And I shared that with a few people and they loved it. And when I had to eventually take it down because builder.io, the platform was really taking off a lot more than builder flights. I wasn't really trying to get people to use builder flights, but whatever. Um, I had to shut down. So people were really, really upset. Those types of things. So it's tedious work that you can automate. I think makes for fantastic projects you could work on. Um, is this plugin open source? You know, it actually used to be, it no longer is because we've actually had to bake in a lot of very custom things to it. Um, I've had an interesting experience with open source. You know, open source, I love. I love, 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 love. But I also hate. <laughs> I'll take a very simple example. I won't name the name, but I made this really cool project. It was one of the first ever Figma plugins and I, I built it all open source. And what it did is it allowed you to take any live website. It, it still works here, actually. We can still go over here. It's still part of this plugin. And here, enter a website and hit import to Figma. And we'll use Puppeteer to open the website in the browser, analyze everything, and then migrate it all to Figma layers, all open source. And guess what happens? I make this thing um, and somebody else sees it. And they say, oh, that's nice. And they make some improvements. And that's great. I didn't have time to improve it at the time. But instead of making a pull request and contributing back, they decide to make their own plugin. And they decide to sell it for like $20 a month or something. And they give no credit to me. It was clearly a fork of what I had made because it copied everything. I had figured out how to put it in the format of a Chrome extension and all these things, like all kinds of ways to make it easy to import like logged in sites, all these different things. And um, they just copied everything. They stole all of it. They made some improvements on it. Totally agreed. Some of their stuff improved it. And they just sold it. They didn't credit it. And now they're a more popular plugin than the one I had made. Completely stolen, completely ripped off. But they're allowed to, it was MIT licensed. I was the type who was like, hey, this stuff doesn't usually happen that much. People are not gonna just steal your stuff. The open source community is legit. And yeah, and so here's you know here's a website we imported with that, that uh, Figma plugin that I had made. Awesome, this is the builder site, came in pretty well. People will steal your stuff. They will pop it off of it. They will rip you off. They will um, not credit you. And that's just how it goes. And so we've been more cautious about what we open source ever since. I'm still a little bit, little bit not, not happy about how that went. So since then, anything that is kind of related to our business, we keep it um, closed source in, in most cases like this that you're seeing here. Um, yeah, it was crazy. I, I could not believe it. And um, yeah, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> As you could tell, it was just, just a messed up thing to do. And I didn't think somebody would do. Now that said, the quick framework, the party time project, so many other things you could open source. Um, oh yeah, and Puppeteer. Puppeteer, um, yeah, to get the website. Um, these days, um, I would recommend Playwright. I think it's a little bit nicer to use than Puppeteer. It, it was inspired by Puppeteer. Um, how do we create the builder UI? It's material UI, some custom drag and drop, um, MobX for reactivity. React plus MobX can go a long way. Now, if I were to rebuild it today, I would build it in quick. Um, but that's how we build the builder UI. And actually, I think our feature works here. I'm trying to think, now I need to give this feature over to Adam and Manu who are building on top of this. But yeah, we pretty much have this do stuff button. We have log out. Um, I can, let's rename this do stuff, do stuff. Um, maybe I'll comment it out. Maybe I'll just let them know like, hey, here's an example of making a request. Um, they will need to replicate some of this logic of like how you pass this initialization stuff. Actually, we should probably make, hmm, let's do one more little nicety for Adam and Monum before I pass this um, stuff over to them. I'll do that in the next 10 minutes before I have to go to my next meeting. Um, but the one thing I don't like about this is I have this weird logic for, because the uh, Figma plugin thread and the UI thread are, are completely separate processes, 
and you had to message between them. Um, I think, um, you know, it would be a lot better to be able to store this as some type of global variable and maybe we'll use MobX for it so that we can reactively listen to it. So let's do this. Maybe we'll use um, a boxed value. A boxed value in MobX is literally a signal. It's just a different name. Um, so let's do this. Let us create. So now we're gonna create a global reusable store here. Um, maybe I'll call it a store. Uh, I'm kind of in, yeah, it's not a constant. I'm gonna make a new folder here. Um, stores yeah plural seems right functions constant stores yeah and then um builder space info.ts oh we are mixing that's not good okay we're mixing a little bit of stuff here let me let me try this again stores builder space info.ts okay now i'm going to move some of this logic around um, I'm going to do this and this, I'm going to put it here. Um, I'm going to use a MobX computed. So import, uh, not MobX, a uh, box, I forget. From MobX, I forget, I think it's called a boxed, boxed, is box observable? I could just create an observable. You might, maybe I'll just do that, observable. Let's just do that. And let's say, oh, I didn't know you stream subscribing. Haha, <laughs> thanks. Um, const um builder space info actually yeah i like the idea of this being an observable yeah i like the idea of this being an observable actually you'll see why in a moment so we can both do um let's do um space id um user id and then we're gonna go dit get is logged in um return boolean this dot private key there we go um Ooh, Poet has a good question. I'll answer in a moment. So one thing I love about MobX observables is you can mix data and computed values, and these are automatically cached and reactive, which is beautiful. So now I'm going to say um, on complete builder space info dot space ID dot user ID. This is a great thing about GitHub Copilot. Um, builder space info to private key, mesh private key. Beautiful. That's a public plugin message. Cool. And, uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, this is dot, sorry. Builder, uh, sp private space info equals message dot builder space info. There we go. And now we want to do this. Do, 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 do. There we go. Um, if, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Beautiful. Why are we still unhappy? Why are we unhappy here? It's possibly null. Oh, duh, it says if not, if not. Okay, cool. Now this is way more reusable. I like that. And so, um, okay, we're making progress here. Builder space info, we're going to import. Don't need this, don't need this. We want to export, export this. Now we can use this cross components. It'll be much nicer. Um, Builder space info. I think we can import this. Cool. Is user logged in? Now we can actually uh, user uh, is logged in. There we go. All right, we're looking better. Let's double check the things work still. Uh, our types are not happy. Logout is not assigned. One second. Okay. Type UI init complete. Um, and builder space does not accept on UI init complete message. Okay, let's go to that. What are you talking about? Builder space info is right here. Builder space. This is why TypeScript errors are not not the most wonderful thing in the world. UI init complete message. Builder space info. Builder space info or no. And builder space does not accept on UI init complete message. It does though. Let's restart this. What is wrong? Set space info. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Now this is actually, you know what? Maybe let's just leave this out. And that way we can check is logged in. Private key. Let's just go not, not. 
Maybe all of our TypeScript will be happy now. And oh, I observable object. Yeah. Um, let's do this as. Let's do this. One sec. Export. Oh wait, we haven't as as. Let's do this as builder private space info. There we go. There we go. We're gonna use the simpler type here. Folly man. Awesome. Um, ooh, I really like this question. I am going to come back to this. Um, oh my goodness, I love Mobex so much more than Redux. I hate reducers. I hate the overemphasis on immutability. I hate the lack of safety. Latest Redux is better. Mobex is Mobex works the same way signals work. And if you've seen people going crazy over signals in SolidJS, now they've been added to Preact, though they're simpler there, simpler in, in a, a way that has pros and cons. Um, um, quick, uh, with view use for reactivity, I, I, I can make a whole video um, on MobX versus Redux, but I'm a huge fan of MobX and the much, much simpler reactivity model, much more conventional reactivity model as well. Um, okay, let's double check this is all. <laughs> Thank you, Spark Fusion. Um, let's double check that our stuff works. We just did a refactor and we don't have exhaustive tests yet. So let's check do stuff. Did do stuff work? Good, do stuff worked. Let's log out. Let's log in. Uh, log out was persisting on refresh, so that was what we wanted. Authorize, beautiful, close window, okay. Back to Figma, do stuff, should work again. Uh, oops, 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 oh, that's fine. That's the poll, that's okay. Uh, good, and let's change how do stuff works really quickly. Let's make it hello, let's say goodbye, everyone. Because I have to re wrap up the stream soon, I'm sorry. But I do want to answer one of the questions that came in before I wrap. Um, okay, back to Figma. Now let's reload, let's see if the login persisted. Login persisted, do stuff. It should say goodbye everyone, goodbye everyone. Yes, I think our feature works, everybody. Okay, so let's do the last step here. We're gonna send pull requests. Um, for my ugly login button, but this is okay. And now what I'll do is I'll create a loom next. One thing I love to do is create looms. Let me write this down, hold on. AI loom, I'll get back to this in a moment. Okay, uh, auth, auth functionality for Figma plugin. UI is ugly, but functional. We can come back and clean up the, up the UI later, but I want to unblack unblock the champs, um, Adam and Manu, um, for now. Cool, I'm gonna get, push this up. I'll create my pull request. I'll do a self review of my code. Let's all do this too. Um, auth, auth KV functionality. And I wanna also put in here, to do. Uh, deprecate me, I'm not using Next.js actually. I'm using Express and I'm just using a, a simple create React app on the uh, front end for now for the Figma plugin. Deprecate me, deprecate these unauthenticated endpoints and use the authenticated ones. Once we migrate our Figma plugin to use the authentic, authentic, auth to endpoints. There we go, beautiful. We should do this very soon. Um, auth to KV functionality. Great, git push origin. Now we're gonna make a couple pull requests. So we're going to two different repos here. Um, Figma plugin and the IO uh, builder internal, okay? So we're gonna make a pull request. Uh, I love that little detail. Um, auth functionality for plugin. Ugly UI to be cleaned up later, but should unblock Adam plus Manu. Um, cool. So I am going to create a pull request. I'm gonna double check that my code looks okay. We'll do that self review together. So this is the self review step of you've created code. Now we wanna make sure it looks good. And then here, I'm gonna send this as well. Um, Figma, uh, let's see. Yeah. Auth. Uh, auth support for Figma plugin and um, uh, KV. Cool. Uh, let's create pull request. 
and now we'll do a quick self review and then I'll mention one other thing I do. We often do this for pull request reviews, so it doesn't really make sense to do on stream right now, or maybe it does. And it might be weird to do on stream. Anyway, so here's our code. This is where we can skim it and say, hey, does this look like good code? Does this look like something we should actually check into the code base? And when somebody else is seeing this, what are they gonna see? In fact, one thing we should look at is our console.logs. Um, those look okay. These are just some example logs and some basic notifications. That looks okay to me on quick look. And console, we got no console logs here. We have our new Figma auth endpoint, which all seems to be working. We'll deploy all this stuff soon. I'll need to deploy the back end before we have the front end. Um, in fact, I should actually make a note on that Pyre pull request. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we'll need to merge and deploy this before this all works. So let's go back over here. Let's link to this. We need to merge and deploy this. I used command K as a shortcut there to provide the link inside of the markdown using GitHub. I love how GitHub uses markdown everywhere. It's beautiful. And some nice little keyboard shortcuts and nice these there too. Okay, now we need to make sure things pass. I have a cool little um, script I have in the main builder repo called pre-PR. Actually, I usually use NR. If you don't use NI, the CLI, it's beautiful. GitHub NI by Anthony Fu, beautiful. NI is an easy way where you don't have to accidentally um, run NPM in a Yarn project or Yarn in a PNP project or anything. Just use NI, NI instead of instead of these. Use NI instead of NPM install, Yarn install, PNPM bun. Um, use NR to run instead of NPM run, etc., etc., etc. It's, it's beautiful stuff. It also has some niceties like an NPM run. You need to double dash before your args in NR, you don't, Oof, thank goodness. And so I have this cool script I made called pre-PR that runs the most common um, checks that tend to fail in the CI locally. And it also runs a prettier and it looks like we're doing good. This one actually fails because of how we set up our NPM config. That, be, that was a whole nightmare. We just kind of ignore that for now because it's working. And um, I think our PRs will pass. Now, the last thing I usually do is I create a loom. Um, I don't know if you all use loom, but um, loom is a simple tool where you can just record yourself um, um, talking and you could send a link to someone of that. And so it'll show, it'll go three, two, one, and then I can talk. This is phenomenal for transferring information asynchronously. So we often send looms in our PRs. Rather than writing this huge doc, you just think about how would I talk to a person about this? How would I explain this to a person? So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go back to that Figma repo. My loom's still recording. You'll see how this works. I just wanna show you how it works. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna follow up with a loom. Looms are also much better than talking to people in person because they exist forever. We have so many cases where someone new joins or you forget what someone said to you. And if you shared it via a loom, then you can refer back to it anytime. We created all these looms over time as a um, solution to, um, you know, working asynchronously just, and because I, I, I'm lazy and I, I don't want to wait for you to have time and I don't want to wait for me to have time. I just want to fire and forget looms. And I don't want to think about how to write something. I can talk much faster than I can write. If I write, I, I start thinking about what words to use. If I talk, you have no option and talking is quite natural, <laughs> you know, in my opinion. Uh, my mental expectation for writing and talking is, is different for some reason. I think I have a couple more minutes before meeting. Okay, good, I do. Um, and so, I just send looms all the time. I have something to say to you, I'm gonna send it async as a loom, watch it when you have time. You can refer back to it anytime and you can share it if there's a reason to share it. Now when employees are onboarded to Builder, they see a bunch of looms from me. I didn't even intend any of these to be onboarding resources. We just, the loom had been passed around because people found it useful to refer back to and then it ended up in onboarding and now people, you know, they join and say, hey, I, I, I appreciate your loom on this. And I was like, oh, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know anybody even still sees these things. So it's awesome. So I will create a loom in a minute. This is how it works. And then when you hit stop, you just get this share link and then you can just send it to anybody, um, which is pretty cool. We have AI. I thought we didn't enable the loom AI features. Oh, it's a trial. Okay. The loom AI features are a little bit expensive. I don't find them to be that 
uh, useful. But I guess we're we're getting it for free now for a temp, uh, uh, time box time. But anyway, I will send a loom in this explaining how I set this up. I made this feature for Adam and Mono to use. I'll say, hey, we've got this log in, log out button. We have this do stuff that mostly just shows how you'll utilize this API for your purposes. Um, and that's it. And that's all they need to really worry about. Um, oops, I think I moved my head. Did my head move? I don't know. Uh, I did something weird. Sorry, I'm streaming software setup glitch. What is going on? I don't know. I'll figure it out later. Um, but yeah, so they'll know how to use this. They could pick up and roll with it and then we will be all set. Um, and then they can just shoot questions to me and they'll probably shoot questions as a loom or we'll jump on a quick zoom. Uh, we do that a lot too. Okay, last couple questions I want to answer before I have to wrap and jump into meetings. Um, really happy that I got these features done. I will let them know with a loom in a moment. So there were two questions. One in particular was really interesting. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah. So if we're starting from scratch, what reactivity system would you use? Joe is really popular. I still find MobX to be very, very robust, very capable, very performant, very beautiful. So I still opt for MobX everywhere. I know it's not the hot thing. You're not going to find people talk about it on Twitter much. It's not going to be a whole, um, often talked about, but I am a huge fan of it. You know, there's a difference between the best project and the best marketed project. Um, and marketing your project is an important thing to do, don't get me wrong. But MobX is something that is not going through huge marketing, but it is extremely incredibly good in my opinion. Um, so, okay. So this is a really, really good question I want to answer. I swear there was one more in here I really want to answer. Um, Oh, actually, here's a really quick one from Shubham. How do I plan a project from start to finish? I don't. So this has only been ranted about a lot lately. I do not do giant planning and architecting and development in a waterfall style. I do iteration. This is all the best developers I've ever worked with use this approach. This includes prolific open source developers. This improves, this uh, in, in, um, includes uh, incredible developers of, of all kinds. They don't plan start to finish, they just start coding. And they start prototyping and they start figuring out their boundaries, figuring out what works. And that's, in my experience, how you come up with the best solutions, the most optimal solutions, and often the most unknown solutions. Meaning, one thing our company is known for, for some people, is coming up with solutions to problems that have not been solved before. Um, Quick.js, um, the mitosis compiler, um, the build or visual platform, all these are things that never existed prior. Nobody knew how to create a visual editor that could work across any tech stack elegantly and, and natively and performantly. Before Mitosis, nobody knew how to compile a React component to other uh, frameworks like Vue, Quick, uh, Nuxt, um, Svelte, Marco, etc. Um, before Visual Copilot, nobody knew how to use AI to automatically take a static design to be fully responsive and automatically match your coding styles, uh, your specific preferences. These were all, in QuickJS, nobody knew how to make a more performance style of front-end framework that was automatic and just wildly simpler than what came before it. Um, these were all the byproduct of experimentation, of saying, we don't know the solution. In all of these cases, we did not know the solution going in. If we did, other people would have already solved it. We would have already solved it. What we had to do is we had to start experimenting and trying things. And so without major planning, we actually just started experimenting and we started trial and erroring. And trial and error is shockingly good at teaching you what you can do and you can't do. And when you do it enough, and if you iterate fast enough, it takes a lot of experimentation, you can end up in a solution that looks so different than you expected, so different than anyone expected. And you look back and say, wow, how did we even get here? And it really was a million little steps that took you there and made you realize. And it allows you to be in a position where you know all the reasons why you didn't do it any other way. Why people might have thought you, why did you not do this? Why did you not do this? And most of the time you can answer, I tried it and it didn't work and here's why. And that's really, really good because then you know, well, let's say somebody might create a competing project. Well, you already have a really good understanding of, well, what might they try and where might they fail? And if you didn't go through all the trial and error, you also can have a lot of anxiety because somebody might say, hey, company X just launched this thing and they use this approach. And in the past, I'd be like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Oh no, maybe that's better. Today, I'm like, oh yeah, we tried that. It's not a good idea. Like I could already tell you, like here's the problems that they're either going to face or already facing. 
and why they're going to have to rethink that whole thing. Because <laughs> we've already been there, we've already tried it, we've already done that. And the way you get to that point in a time efficient manner is you try and experiment as rapidly and efficiently as possible. You very fast iteration loops from idea and prototype, revise the idea until you already get to a, what I call the working solution, then you can do cleanup and ship. And once it's shipped and it's tested on users, you're gonna still iterate on the user feedback. So you're gonna come back through here and eventually you'll land in, if you do your job right, and if you have a bit of luck, you'll land into the state of being a, an essential feature, an essential product, something that is essential to people's workflows. And this, in my opinion, is where you start doing more of what a lot of people advise you to do. This is where you start writing more exhaustive unit tests, more exhaustive end-to-end -end tests. You don't want essential functionality to break. This functionality that's still getting user validation still is likely to change. So the amount of testing, you want to have a balance of how much testing and how, how deep you go. This is when you're going to add more tests. This is where you're going to add a lot more polish. This is where you're going to actually add a lot more refactoring of code. Because at this point, we have learned something that is absolute gold. The most golden thing, the most valuable thing, in my opinion, in producing products and producing software, here's gonna be our gold, gold, unfortunately it's kind of brown, trophy. <laughs> that looks kind of like a weird, poopy wine glass. <laughs> um, this, why is that two different layers? This, let's do a star instead. This is the gold everybody's looking for. What is the essential feature that the users need and how does it need to work? And that's when you finally know what the ideal way to build it is. And this is when you have an essential feature, you have tests, you have polish, polish of the code, polish of the UI, polish of the user flows, polish of the onboarding. You start really thinking hard about it. Well, how, what should the first touch of this feature be like? How do we get people value immediately? This stuff is really important if you want your product to grow and spread. And then this is where you might do major refactors. This is where you might do a V2, where you actually do the thing that big companies love to do is a major waterfall process. What I mean by that is this has happened to us a few times where we have a very clearly defined understanding of the problem, what users need. And the only way you know that with certainty is actually having live users. You can't do this before the feature's live. You have to do it after it's live. And then you can actually step back and say, we know exactly the criteria, exactly what this needs to deliver. And you'll probably find through your iteration, there are a couple known weaknesses that are not easy to solve. Maybe there's some performance setbacks that some early decisions made it hard to, to solve later. A lot of people want to over-optimize in the beginning. They want to over-performance optimize at the start of a project. Don't do that. Worry about it later. Most things can be solved iteratively, probably 10 times more than you think. Engineers, in my experience, love to worry. They have to worry about how they're their choices will bite them. I wouldn't worry about that personally. Um, what I would do is laser focus on building an essential feature that are proven by your customers to be exactly what they want. And then sometimes you do a big rebuild, you do a big V2. We did this with a few things. We did this with our content APIs. We learned that for our business, we need to serve dynamic, fast, personalized contact, content as huge scale. And we learned that some of our our, our choices early on, which we had no way of knowing would be the right or wrong choice at the time, such as the database choice, was a terrible fit for our actual production needs. And we only knew our actual production needs, not before the project, only, 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 only after the project. And we started seeing what actual challenges we hit in production. The easy ones to fix got iteratively fixed. The hard ones became part of a rebuild. And we rebuilt the whole content API infrastructure. It was a huge project, but we knew it was worthwhile because we knew what we needed we knew how to do it this time, and we knew it was worth it. It was important to our business. Very, very, very rare. So 99% of the work happens over here, and then a tiny percent happens over here. The only other circumstance where we did this was with our next generation SDKs. We built React SDK and an Angular SDK for our um, ability to deliver dynamic content to your website. So drag and drop with your components and render that on your site. And we found that we people needed to support way more frameworks than we expected, and they need cert, there were certain drawbacks on how we first approached it. So we, we did a complete rebuild. We, we had a lot of people in production using it, and we knew exactly what they needed, the, the pains that were hard to solve, and the benefits that were hard requirements. And when we did the big rebuild, we knew exactly what to do. And it's funny because even when we did that, we actually hired somebody relatively new in, in a leader, leadership position in engineering, and they were adamant we had to build it differently. 
And luckily, luckily, thank goodness, I was able to say, I assure you from real world experience, we cannot do it the way you want. I totally understand theoretically why it seems to make sense, but from the real world user feedback, the real world user usage, this, the, the, the approach you want to take would cut off one of the most essential features. We have a, a known constraint, we have a known feature we have to support, and there's just no way around it. And they really wanted to fight me on it, and it was just, there was no fight to be had because we just knew. We knew what users needed, and so there was no art debating to be had. And that's what I love. You don't want to do this if you don't already know what you need. And in 99% of cases, you don't know unless you've already built it already. And I mean built not as a prototype, all the way to customers. And I just find that as businesses grow, as teams grow, people love to say, well, why don't we just go straight to the solution? Why don't we go straight to the end state? Why don't we... Why don't we just start with the tests and start with the polish and start with the, the perfectly refactored code? And that's always a mistake. It's easy to say, it's like, hey, this seems like a lot of waste. Why don't we just do this? But there's an arrogance to that. There's an assumption of what you, th what you believe you need. And it drives me crazy how often people just assume they know what people need and how often they're almost always wrong. It's like the, um, there's a name for this. Oh, what is it? Hold on, let's go chat GPT. Um, the, what is the name of the principle where the less you know about something, the more you think you know? <laughs> this thing is hilarious. Dunning-Kruger effect. Oh my goodness. The Dunning, oh my God, it's replacing these notes all the time. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Let me show you a visualization of this. Ugh, ugh, I can't highlight this text because it keeps being replaced. There we go. Show an image. Yeah. Carson's got it right too. Dunning-Kruger effect. This happens to everybody and we just got to know this happens is when you don't know anything about something and when you're building new products and you're at the very beginning, you got to understand you don't know anything about it. You have ideas, but you don't know anything. Like really, you don't know anything, but you think you know, and that's the problem. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And then eventually, eventually you reach a point of expertise where you both, um, you know that you know. And that's where, you know, everybody wants to pretend they are, but they're not, they're here. I don't care how many products you built before, you have to approach every new product or feature as I don't know anything. It's so important, it's so easy. It's so, it can be an anxious feeling to feel that way, but it's one that is real. You have to acknowledge it, you can't ignore it. You can't pretend you're an expert, you can't pretend you're perfect. And I see people, I don't know if it's the corporate environment of, you know, you just want to look good to your peers because, you know, whatever that might be part of your peer evaluation. Um, but ha <laughs> RSC, I definitely think was the Dunning-Kruger effect. That is a very, very valid point. Um, and that's, it's hard, you know, with Quick, we had a lot of time to prototype and figure things out and this and that. I know RSC did, but you know, it's, I try not to assume, but it very much could have been that. But just remember when you're building new things, you know nothing. Don't fall into this trap. Don't start specking it out as if you know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. Just start prototyping, exploratory prototyping iteration. That's my opinion. That's what worked, worked really well for me. Um, last thing I want to mention, and then I'm already late for a meeting, so <laughs> sorry, Francesco. I will be on the meeting in one moment. But the last thing I want to answer, um, where was it? Yeah, Samir asks, advice for front-end developers to become irreplaceable in tech industry and how we can use AI to become future-ready front-end developers. Yes, I, I have uh, uh, two opinions, maybe three on this. Opinion one is use AI tools in your day-to-day. -day. Start training yourself, in my opinion, this is personal preference, start training yourself to start with ChatGPT instead of Google. Always question the AI, don't forget that, don't always take it at face value. But really, use ChatGPT or use GitHub Copilot Chat. I've been trying to use GitHub Copilot Chat more too. It's kind of the same thing, but it has more awareness of your specific code repo, which is cool, and a few other nice tools to make it aware of the nuances that are unique to your project and, and what you're doing right now. Um, also use GitHub Copilot and get you get good with GitHub Copilot. I have definitely over time developed an intuition as to what will GitHub Copilot know, right? Watch, I bet you if I go async, function not authorized, it's gonna know exactly, perfect. That was a good example of something it's gonna know. Now if I say async, also if I say function like Fibonacci, right, it's gonna know. Actually, it's, hold on, it's gonna have to supply the args. It's gonna know, right, beautiful. Um, why is it complaining? Why is it I'm just random curiosity. 
is defined but never used. Oh, haha, <laughs> that's a weird um, mistake in the text you compiled or highlighting the wrong thing. Um, some things it won't know, and that's what you should get good at. There are a lot of cases where I know it's going to autocomplete the next five lines for me, and I know it's going to be right, and I know I hardly even have to look at it. And I know from trial and error there are certain areas that, that won't work well. And that's another example of let's not, <laughs> let's not theorize where ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot will help our workflow. Let's just try it. Trial and error. Try, try, try. The same idea works for just getting proficient with AI tools. So that's one category. Use AI tools day to day. Make help it make let it make you a better developer, a more efficient developer, a faster developer. The second one is learn how to use AI in building products and features. This is probably going to start more with side projects, but there's really two areas to explore here. One is just using an LLM. I would definitely say in my experience, open AI's APIs like GBT 3.5 are the best, fastest, cheapest LLMs that I've experienced to date. I've tried many, many, many. So they're not just the most hyped. They actually are, um, they are actually really, really good quality. And, and they're not like, a, oh, this one, they're you know good, but they're expensive. No, they're such a good balance of cost, um, uh, quality and performance. And which is awesome. Um, ooh, who's the best engineer I've ever met? I, I have an answer for this. Um, now, um, the thing about LLMs in general is they are uh, expensive. And you know, the good news though is if you use ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot Chat, those are basically the same thing as those APIs. So you can experiment what do I send, what do I get out, how do I parse it, how do I use it. And using the JSON response from OpenAI, I actually have realized is much cooler than I realized. Um, and you don't have to have as much JSON parsing logic. That's something I really should be using more, um, which is pretty neat. Um, the second thing is, and this is the more advanced, is you can learn how to train your own models. Um, that takes more work, but I have a YouTube video on this, so I'll, I'll show you. Um, YouTube, let's see, I'll find my channel. This gives you just a quick overview of how to think about training your AI, like when you should train your own model um, and why you might do it model and how you might go about it. Um, so this video is a bit about how to do the training. It's something worth experimenting with, though there is a, a you, it does cost money to train. Though if you have, a, I finally just got one, like a, a computer with a decent GPU, get like a gaming PC, a gaming laptop, um, that can allow you to do the training yourself, let that run overnight, etc. Um, and then also this video is pretty popular. AI product. This one talks about the trade-offs of, of which AI approach to potentially take. Um, those are my personal tips on how to stay ahead um, and and deal with um, you know being the best developer, the met, the most irreplaceable developer, and, and and understand how to use AI tools. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, Carson's a good point about imposter syndrome when talking about planning and foresight and this and that. I'm a big believer in this really helps with imposter syndrome. Just don't don't feel like you need to know things and you're imposter if you don't. I think it's better to feel like you don't know things and that's expected. Nobody knows things. I've actually seen people not succeed in their jobs, not because they don't know things, but because they think they need to know things and they're insecure when they don't or they feel ashamed when they don't. Rather, embrace not knowing. And every time somebody asks you a question, you don't have to have an answer. All you have to say is, I'll get back to you with an answer. I'll either figure it out, I'll ask somebody for help, this could apply to all kinds of roles. Um, I do think the future of AI is LLMs plus other types of models. Other types of models, more classic models, neural networks, um, random forests, um, those are much faster, much cheaper, and can be much more specialized to your use case. And that is really essential sometimes. LLMs are not the solution to everything. Uh, one of my videos really shows that. Uh, who is the best engineer I've ever met? Um, I'll say the best engineer I've ever worked with because it's hard to know if you just met somebody if, you, if they're the best. The best engineer I've ever worked with is Manu. Manu, who works on our team. Let's find him. I think he's on LinkedIn. Manu um, Martinez Almeida. I think it's the way we spell his name. Best developer I've ever worked with. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different criteria here. Manu is just crazy intelligent and he's the best at solving problems I've ever seen in my life. So if we're talking about solving very, very hard engineering problems, absolute best I've ever worked with. If we're talking about the full balance, leadership, ownership, et cetera, um, this is Chaudhry. It's another person on our team. It's it, I feel very good about our team. Um, Sham. Sham, incredible. He actually lives in Mumbai. He's lived in the United States for a long time. He lives in Mumbai where he was born and raised. And um, absolutely phenomenal leadership, technical abilities, 
just anything you need done, research, development, creating new things, solving hard problems, whatever you need, he is phenomenal figuring out. He's phenomenal leading other people to figure out the solution too. And this is really, really, really huge. Um, how could you be 1% more like Manu today? I will tell you, do more prototyping, solve problems through trial and error and do it as fast as possible. Um, that's what Manu is really, really good at. He just grinds and just figures it out and he just goes and goes and goes until he finds a solution. He tries a thousand things until he finds the answer. And that might sound silly, but it's extremely effective and it's a skill you can grow. You might not be good at it at first and the more you do it, the more you get good at it. You can solve more and more wild, amazing things. Okay, I am seven minutes late for a meeting, so I'm gonna wrap the stream here. I extremely appreciate you all coming on. I will do more streams, I'll answer more questions, I'll build more stuff, but we finally finished the feature we've been working on all week. I think I streamed every single day this week, including on the weekend. The weekend I was just talking concepts, the week I was actually building out something here. Appreciate your questions. Appreciate y'all participating. I have limited my stream now to only YouTube because we had some problems on X and um, LinkedIn wasn't getting, a, it was getting some people on, but it wasn't, you know, huge for engagement. I still cannot get Twitch to work. I cannot get Restream to connect to Twitch correctly. So YouTube is the place to go for my streams. Thank you so much for joining and I will be on another day, maybe even this weekend. I'm not sure. We'll figure it out.